Good morning. Thank you all for coming to the celebration of the life of our President Emeritus, Obadiah Harris. My name is Greg Salyer, and I'm the President of the University and the Society. And on behalf of our staff, faculty, students, and alumni, I welcome you. And now, Professor Juan Hernandez, performing Prelude Number 1 by Aitor Via Lobos.
Obadiah was not only my boss, he was also my friend. And I speak on behalf of our staff who admired and respected him as well. Ob Obadiah had the gift of insight and he used it deftly. When I interviewed with him to teach here, it was a Thursday and before I left his office, I'd been given a class to teach on Monday and two theses to read before I left. I watched him act on his insight and intuition repeatedly over the last few years, and you should know that not everyone was approved and invited in, so there was a spirit of discernment at work in Obadiah as well. There have been a few people in my life who have seen through my faults to a potential that even I could not see, and to them I owe great debts. One was my father a man much like Obadiah and from a generation that knew suffering. Another was my dissertation advisor who took a wide-eyed kid from the hills of Tennessee and made him a scholar and teacher. Another is my wife Whitney who treats my faults like weather and simply waits for them to pass. <laughs> and there was Obadiah Harris <clears throat> who saw in me not a man who was a little too old and a little too lost but a man who could succeed him at this beloved institution. For that, I will always be humbled and grateful. And you know what else? He did that for all of us here. And the people he hired are his last legacy to PRS. We're a little island of misfit toys, people who can thrive in most any situation, but who need a safe space to truly flourish and in whom Obadiah saw great promise and the ability to bring joy and wisdom to the people of UPR and PRS, just as he did. In a time when shallowness and crudeness have taken center stage, Obadiah will be remembered as a man of depth and kindness. In a time when narcissism and indecency have captured our attention, Obadiah will be remembered as a giving and decent man in a time of increasing expressions of shrillness and complaint, Obadiah will be remembered as a sage and a humorist. After all, who do you know who still whistles while he works? Who do you know who dresses in a jacket and tie every day, even if he has no appointments, just to be professional? Who do you know who is quick to laugh, smile, to say a kind word, to make a joke, especially at his own expense? He was a friend to us, and we counted ourselves lucky to be called his friend. He was a father figure to many of us, and we looked to him for guidance. He was a sage to many of us, and we looked to him for wisdom, and we found it. Thank you, Obadiah. And now, Walter Hansel, chairman of the board of directors, our legal counsel, and Obadiah's good friend. Some splendid words from our friend Greg. Well, I knew Obadiah since about 1989, uh, 30 years ago. So uh, strangely enough, that seems like a long time to me. But I guess when I met him, he was about the age that I am now. So he had a whole nother lifetime. Um, before and after. Uh, he he uh, is a unique man, uh, very learned, a scholar, uh, a teacher, um, uh, very versed in the ways of, of big institutional education um, uh, that, that seem at odds with an institution like Philosophical Research Society and our university, um, but uh, he he uh, had great appreciation for uh, uh, identifying and conserving the wisdom traditions of cultures around the world throughout history, uh, and recognizing, or at least what I took from it, is that. Uh, in a spiritual sense, people are 
um, uh, not different from each other around the globe and not really that much different um, uh, across time going back quite a long way. Um, and uh, it's a, a, a curiosity of life that we all start out as babies and we have maybe some built-in uh, evolutionary learning, but we have uh, uh, one, one lifetime, or depending on what you believe, at least one lifetime at a time to, to figure out um, how to live. And uh, there's um, an, an enormous reservoir of, of learning and experience built into cultures around the world. And uh, Obadiah was a, a deep scholar of that, uh, uh, both in, in learning and in teaching and in what he incorporated into his own life. And as Greg said, uh, uh, in, in the context of our age, he, he was a, uh, a selfless, humble uh, person who um, uh, saw the individual in everybody he met and, uh, and found things in people that uh, enabled them to, to uh, blossom under the, the illumination and the shelter and, and uh, protection uh, of, of his energy. Um, a, so he, he was a unique man. I learned uh, so much from him. And uh, at the same time, he, he was a very spiritual person, including that his experiences in life sometimes brought him opportunities or people who would have propositions for him where he might become more powerful or more wealthy or, or have benefits for himself uh, that they, you know, thought would induce him to do things that they wanted him to do, and and he really had no difficulty in discriminating and just sort of deflecting that stuff aside, not being distracted from things that are more important, um, uh, and and that's that's an example and um, much to be admired, um, but he also. Um, uh, he he had a a soft side and and or or a a soft aspect of his nature throughout um, and and a very loving side, um, uh, but it didn't mean he he was a a a fool or that he had unlimited patience for foolishness and he knew that life is short and time is short and. Um, uh, it, it really matters to, to follow uh, what's important and find what has meaning and not get distracted by the, the just endless opportunities to get distracted with things that are um, not important or not meaningful or not contributory or worse, you know. Um, so, so he, he, uh, he, he, he had a crunchy granola factor, but it it, it didn't overtake him altogether. Um, and and uh, I, although I met him when he had had a pretty full life already, um, uh, there may be others, uh, uh, and certainly Lana and his family who knew him in an earlier time. But he he's uh, uh, a man from uh, Oklahoma. He was. Um, uh, a, a very tough individual. He endured all kinds of things in life, as as we do. But um, uh, he he really was tough, um, uh, a strong, tough, um, and uh, a um, a teacher. There was there was some preacher in him, uh, and. Uh, when when I was younger, I wouldn't have thought uh, someone being a preacher was necessarily uh, a a positive attribute. Um, and uh, but but he was a 
a preacher in the best sense of of bringing the light, sharing the light, um, and and bringing people together and um, uh, looking and finding meaning without uh, prejudice and uh, with openness to all of the good in people and in the world, which is, uh, it, it takes a, a courage to do that because the there's a big thread in the world of, of uh, um, you know, history is just an endless accumulation of mayhem and cruelty and awfulness, um, but that's not all there is. And and he did have the, uh, the, the courage to uh, keep his faith and believe in people and make them uh, better. And, and boy, do I admire that. Um, uh, but also in, um, uh, he, he, he wasn't, uh, he, he didn't hesitate to ask for what he needed. And I remember um, uh, when I was in the, uh, in the hospital with my wife in the, the, the birthplace and she was um, uh, giving birth to my, my first child and, and this was back before the days of cell phones and uh, Obadiah somehow managed to have me tracked down by the hospital staff to speak with him about some, you know, <laughs> business thing there in the delivery room and uh, and and I, I did actually speak to him for two minutes and we figured it out but um, uh, in hindsight I wonder if he was just trying to make an impression on me at a at a meaningful time um, uh, something else that he used to talk about and he, he in a way it's um, a, an affliction or at least a circumstance of someone who is so contributory and and had relationships with so many people and and important relationships and meaningful relationships with so many people that as uh, uh, as, as life goes on um, uh, we, we lose people and uh, he, he uh, went to a lot of uh, uh, funerals and a lot of memorials, and uh, eventually uh, uh, he let me in on his joke. Um, he used to say, and, and we'd we'd go out and and remember someone. And if you're out at a graveside and the ceremony is over, and and uh, uh, his his way of uh, observing the progression of years for himself was, he'd say, "Well, what do you think?" Uh, should we go back or should we just stay? Um, and uh, of course, he was, he always uh, was going to go back. And and in the time since uh, since he he died, and uh, as as many of you know, it wasn't uh, exactly a, a shocking conclusion to his his life. He had a long life. He he lived well. Um, uh, and and he he had prepared himself and he had the the well he I think he knew his time was coming um, uh, and and he was he he set an example uh, in that as well which is uh, that that life is is so precious uh, that uh, he he was going to stick around until it was over even though it was very hard and he had suffered um, great loss um, uh, but I think his his faith sustained him and and that he I, I think he really did feel like life is so precious I'm 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 gonna see this to the end um, and and he did and uh, I have I have really felt the the loss of him passing and I know his his family has, and and Lana, I thank you for everything that you have done, uh, particularly while he was with us. Um, uh, but um, I, I I do uh, uh, appreciate the chance for us to come together today, and uh, it it I do feel uh, better knowing that uh, his 
his lesson would be um, when we're, we're uh, observing his passing. Um, uh, yeah, we we should go back. You know, let's not stay here. Uh, uh, life is precious, and we go on. Um, so thank you for being here. And now, frequent collaborator, colleague, friend, and lecturer in residence at the University of Philosophical Research, Mitch Horowitz. Obadiah was such a formative figure in my life. Uh, as for many people in this room, I can't imagine, frankly, what life would have been like without his influence. And there are so many lessons to learn from the man's life that his life was like a book of wisdom itself. And as Walter Hansel was describing, he was a person of very deep spiritual commitment, a very deep spiritual search. But he also had this extraordinary capacity to take measurement of situations in the world, a capacity that is so vital and central to the maintenance of an institution like this one. And there was a unique trait that Obadiah possessed, which is that he was exquisitely capable of measuring things and people and situations, not judging them, not judging them, but measuring them and determining whether a certain philosophy, whether a certain business opportunity, whether a certain academic program would fulfill the purposes that he had in mind. And for this reason, Obadiah's life was almost like the passage from one chrysalis to another, from one chrysalis to another. He would, he would know when to exit situations at precisely the right moment because he had found perhaps that what he had arrived to accomplish or what he had arrived to discover had been accomplished, had been achieved and he wouldn't linger. He wouldn't linger at a place with a teaching or even in a relationship necessarily when the time had had passed and and the circumstances had served the aims and the goals and the ideals and the purposes that he arrived for. He grew up in the Pentecostal church, was born in a very small town, Winona, in northeastern Oklahoma, and he was a great lover uh, as, a, as a young man of Pentecostalism. You may have seen uh, among one of the photographs that was projected onto the screen was Obadiah playing guitar as a young man looking a little bit like Roy Orbison, and he used to perform uh, with his father, a minister. They would ride the circuit throughout the South, and they would perform and preach in front of different congregations. And Obadiah deeply, deeply loved Pentecostalism, and he identified with Pentecostal ideals in that its congregants believed and continued to believe that the age of signs and wonders doesn't just belong to some distant biblical past, but that God, that God that performed signs and wonders is still with us today. And he understood, as many people do not, the wonderful, wonderful ideals at the heart of Pentecostalism. And Obadiah certainly could have pursued a career of his own within that congregation. In fact, uh, he recalled to me that a very fetching young minister by the name of Oral Roberts stayed at his family home one day. And that, as many people did, he found Oral just so charismatic and so intellectually exciting and he was absolutely certain that this was a man on the move. And he was correct. You know, at a very young age, he possessed that capacity to measure, to measure. Again, not to judge, but to measure. And 
Obadiah could have walked that path. He had the capacity to walk that path. But he discovered at a relatively young age that as deeply as he loved Pentecostalism, as deeply as he loved his Christian roots and where he came from, he wanted to explore the wisdom traditions of other religions and other faiths. And he didn't feel that there was room for that within that particular paradigm. So again, Obadiah left the chrysalis, branched out onto his own, and he began studying in different branches of the ministry, and he began uh, a speaking career in Phoenix, Arizona. And one day in 1958, there's a group of very dignified people that wandered into Obadiah's congregation in Phoenix, and he noticed that there was this one man at the center of the group who was very clearly the leader and who sort of seemed to radiate something. And he was this small, stoutly built, rotund man, and people were very deferential to him. And at the end of Obadiah's presentation, the man came up and introduced him and said, I really enjoyed your sermon. It was pure science of mine, and my name is Dr. Ernest Holmes. And they shook hands, and Ernest Holmes, as many of you know, was one of the great spiritual luminaries of the 20th century, absolutely beautiful and hugely influential man who had founded a, a positive mind congregation under the name of Science of Mind. And he said to Obadiah, this was in 1958, uh, listen, I want you to come to Southern California. I want you to come to my seminary and study with me. And Obadiah recalled, he said, well, you know, I'll try. And Ernest said to him, don't try, just do it. And so Obadiah did. And he came out here to Southern California and he studied directly with Ernest for two years. And again, he loved Ernest and he loved the science of mind movement till the very last years of his life. But there too, he felt that the boundaries were too constricted. He felt that the intellectual life was not sufficiently rich at that time to sustain everything that he wanted to do. And he quickly had become a protege to Ernest Holmes. And Ernest was very interested, because Ernest too, he was a lot like Obadiah, beautiful man, very deeply steeped in the search, but also very capable of getting things done in the world. And Ernest wanted Obadiah to take over his congregation for him. He was grooming him in that way. And Obadiah went to Ernest on his deathbed, and he said, I I'm sorry, but you know, my search is, is taking me elsewhere. I just have to go my own way. And Ernest looked up at him from his bed and said, I wish I could go with you. And he saw in Obadiah too this quality of search that couldn't be contained within the boundaries of any one doctrine or any one congregation. So Obadiah did branch out and he wound up becoming a a PhD, a doctor of philosophy at the University of Michigan. Can you imagine what an achievement that was for a poor Pentecostal kid who grew up in northeastern Oklahoma to graduate from such an august institution with a degree, a, a doctoral degree in philosophy. And he went into work as a university administrator. And he pioneered programs in community education and continuing education first at uh, the University of Arizona, and then later at uh, the University of New Mexico, where he spent many years. And these were places at the time that didn't have large endowments. Not only did Obadiah pioneer these programs in continuing education at these vast schools, but he personally and on his own steam secured the funding for these programs from local folk, from successful ranchers, from railroad people, from uh, people from oil families. And he had this capacity 
not only to have an idea, but what is an idea? What does an idea become unless it's brilliantly executed? He was capable of executing ideas, and he was capable of speaking to people from all different walks of life so that he could identify somebody within the local community, let's say, who had resources and say, look, I want you to come and fund this program. And at the same time as he could structure a really august academic program, at the same time as he could solicit necessary resources from people who could actually make the program a reality, he could also speak to the everyday student. He could speak to the local gym coach who wanted to take classes in philosophy. He could speak to the local homemaker who wanted to take courses in the history of religion. He had this effortless and entirely genuine capacity to speak to people from a whole vast range of life. So much of that has been lost today. So much of that has been lost today. There was an article written some months ago in the New York Times by a guy who was a humanities professor at one of the Ivy League universities. And he wrote with this kind of embarrassing contrition that he was home one day and he was left alone with a plumber. And he looked upon this gentleman and he realized to his shock that he had nothing to talk to the man about. And I thought to myself, that's a failure of education. That's not a mark of education. That's a failure of education. And Obadiah would never be in that position, nor would he permit one of his students to be in that position. If one of his students said, I don't know what to talk to the plumber about, he would have shown them the door. You know, he would have realized immediately, we're failing you. (laughs) Something's not working here. He had the capacity to move through every area and aspect of life with this effortless effectiveness and genuineness and genuineness. And he saved this place that we're seated in today. He truly, literally saved this place. After the death of Manley P. Hall in 1990, the Philosophical Research Society was in utter turmoil. It was in financial turmoil. It was in legal turmoil. And it was in emotional turmoil. There were all these different competing interests, and it was hard to tell how this terrible, terrible knot could be untangled. And quite frankly, there was every likelihood, the odds were, that it would not be untangled. It was just too great a mess. And there were all kinds of different interests who were competing for money and resources, and there were lawsuits going back and forth. And Obadiah told me the story that one day, one of the many lawyers who were involved in the various legal battles was here on campus, and the meeting with Obadiah turned very Uh, confrontational, and the man said to him, I'm going to take this place apart, brick by brick. And Obadiah said to me, and he said it to me in such a way that I felt I was the other guy seated across from him at the table. He said, he got very steely-eyed, and he said, you just try. (laughs) And (laughs) I loved it, you know. At the same time, the man who said that could listen to a work of music and tears would come from his eyes. He could quote from the Vedas, he could quote from Kabbalah, he could quote from the Tao Te Ching, and tears would well up in his eyes. He was that kind of a person. There was this beautiful, magnificent effectiveness to the man, an effectiveness that can only come from from true education. And that's what he offered the world. And that's what he offered to me. He opened doors to me when no other doors were open. I remember it like it was five minutes ago. In the summer of 2005, he and I were on the phone and we were talking about various things. I had already worked with him on the publication of the reader's edition of The Secret Teachings of All Ages, something that he consented to very quickly and without reservation. And I felt in awe, frankly, that he would place that kind of trust in me because here I was, 
this guy blowing into town and suggesting that we produce this completely new edition of the secret teachings, the, the foundational work of this entire institution. And after we spoke for about 45 minutes or even less, he said, yeah, go ahead and do that. And I was just thrilled that he would place that degree of trust in my hands. And it made me work all the harder on the book to ensure that it was published with the proper degree of integrity and completeness. And a couple of years later, he and I were on the phone and he said to me, I lived in New York City, and he said to me, look, um, if you ever happen to be in the neighborhood, uh, our podium is open to you. And I thought to myself, be in the neighborhood? <laughs> this is an opportunity I am not missing. <laughs> and I immediately booked a hotel, uh, bought a plane ticket and said, well, it so happens I'm going to be in the neighborhood in September. So <laughs> when do you want me to speak? And he opened up this auditorium to me, a guy who no one had heard of, to give a talk which was titled um, The Occult Philosophy in America, which later became my first book, Occult America. And not only did he open this auditorium to me, but he, he accepted me, even though we didn't have precisely the same range of interests. Our interests certainly intersected, but my interests were of a more occultic nature uh, than his were. But again, he had this wonderful capacity, and this is so missing from our culture today, particularly in higher education, particularly in higher education, in which he could understand that Seriousness is derived not from your choice of subject, but from your treatment of subject. And I tell you, that is so absent today in our humanities and our social science departments and our religious studies programs, where people are just filled with timidness and shyness and careerist fears that if they, if they choose the wrong subject, heaven forbid, that will be the end of their career. And their fears, unfortunately, are not unfounded. But Obadiah was the rare kind of educator, the rare kind of administrator who realized that you don't place stock in subject. You place stock in people. And he never, never forgot that. And that was part of his genius. And his willingness to open a door to me at that point in my life made all the difference in the world to me, all the difference in the world. And as Walter Hansel was referencing, every day, regardless of what was going on, the man would wear a jacket and tie. And somewhere online, there's a picture of me and Obadiah in an embrace. And there he is in a, a shirt and tie. And I'm wearing this David Bowie t-shirt with this kind of goofy grin on my face. But that was, again, an example of the manner in which he was comfortable, completely comfortable, with people from all different areas of life. There were just no walls. There were no boundaries with the man because he didn't judge. He measured. He measured. And he understood that you look at an individual, you look at a collaborator, you look at a business opportunity, and you ask, okay, what are my ideals? And is this person or situation or opportunity going to service those ideals? Will this help fulfill those ideals? And if the answer is yes, then you proceed. And if the answer is no, then you gently exit without any rancor, without any argument. It's just a simple no. It's just a simple no. And that was why we entitled Obadiah's wonderful book, The Simple Road. The Simple Road. Because that was the nature of the man's life. He was rich in intellect. He was rich in knowledge and wisdom. But he was not, I must say, he was not a complicated man. He was not a complicated man because he knew what he believed, he understood how to measure things, and he understood how to say yes, how to say no, based on whether something fit the ideal that he was going towards. His life, his life was a book of wisdom itself. And his life 
taught me and taught all of us the true meaning of education. And thank you all very much. Apropos of Mitch's uh, reference to, the, to Ernest Holmes, I have a tribute from Reverend Dr. Christina Tillotson from the Holmes Institute. The Holmes Institute is deeply grateful to Obadiah Harris for the huge blessing he is and to ministerial education for what is now the centers of spiritual living. Obadiah's ahead of his time vision back in the mid 90s when distance education was not well known or even thought of as being effective created what has now evolved into the Holmes Institute online education program that is now and has been a major component of ministerial education for the Centers for Spiritual Living since 1996. On a personal note, I really miss my monthly calls with Obadiah. We would talk about our respective educational institutions and the professors we shared. If I needed a new professor for the Holmes Institute, Obadiah always knew of the perfect expert. I especially miss the personal conversations we had about Dr. Ernest Holmes, Obadiah's writings, being widowed, and life in general. I know he is continuing to make a huge contribution on his next plane of existence. And now, I'd like to invite the family up. <laughs> I'm Lana Shaughnessy, and um, Dr. Harris, Obadiah Harris, that all of you know, and I all were touched in some way or another by, through him, by him, um, I'm his daughter. And so today, I, there's so many things in my head, I don't even know where to start. But on a personal note, he was a wonderful father. He was always loving always ready to give me guidance, maybe whether I wanted it or not, um, <laughs> but full of stories, full of fun. Uh, we played together. There was, there was never a time in my life, and I am now um, 69, and I can't lie because my best friend is sitting right there. <laughs> um, there was never a time we were estranged. So it was really um, a loving journey together, and, and I miss him deeply. And the words of Walter were, were so true, and, and the words of Mitch uh, also were so true. And uh, it brought back a memory, too, of being in Ernest Holmes' home uh, with, my, with my parents, and, um, and, and Ernest Holmes uh, looked at me and looked at my dad, and I've always been told I favor my dad, and he goes, well, she should be called Obadet. And I, <laughs> I thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> Thank goodness that did not happen, but, um, <laughs> but anyway, um, so uh, my husband at the end, and my youngest daughter, Catherine, my first daughter, first grandchild, Carolyn, and my cousin, Vivian, um, so I wanted to come up here all together to give us strength. Um, the last uh, year was really difficult for my father physically. He was just, you know, he was just leaving us. And um, But I, I'm so glad that I was here. And on his last day, which was uh, March the 20th, my husband was with me. And where is Lou? Lou, could you stand up? Lourdes Rock is her name. And if you have a family member that needs a loving, uh, just she's just the best. And she was a caregiver for my dad during the, this past year. And Lourdes, I'm so glad you're here. The, <laughs> the other lady that's not here, um, uh, Ruby, uh, I, I can't pronounce her last name, help me. Huh? 
Makasi. Um, she's working today. I had invited her to come, and she wanted to come, but she's working today. So, so Lourdes and Ruby and I and um, the family, we were with Dad. And on his last day, uh, I got a call from Lou. It was about 8 o'clock in the morning, and she had reported in to check on Dad, and he wasn't doing very well. And she called me, and she said, I don't think I can't take him to breakfast. I He's not doing well. And so she called the hospice coordinator person, and he came. And I came down, and Tim came down, and... Um, and I could see this was this was it. And they had the breathing machine um, to help him get oxygen. And I held his hand, and um, we said the Lord's prayer, or I said the Lord's prayer, and um, and I sang "Abide with Me," which was a special song that my dad and I would sing sometimes. And I was holding his hand this whole time, and and then Tim was on the other side of the bed, and. After that, after the I finished the last verse and abide with me, I was holding his hand, and that was it. And it was peaceful, and it was just a beautiful exit, and I can't, it was just so important that I was there and that I was holding his hand. And, and I started thinking from when I was a little kid, like when I started school, my dad would always walk me to class and he would hold my hand and we'd walk to class and he'd introduce himself and me to the teacher. And so holding his hand at the end was really meaningful. I'm sorry. I knew this would happen. <clears throat> but thanks for the cleanup. <laughs> so <clears throat> I wanted to share that with you. And then I, I was looking through through different things after Dad passed. And over the years, uh, we were apart a lot because he was here for 20-some-odd years. And I was in Washington, D.C., where Vivian is now. And... Um, so I, I would hold on to the notes and, and letters, not all of them, but but some of them. And and so I wanted to share a couple that, that I found if if you if you can be patient. <laughs> and I need glasses now. Mm. Okay. Um so this was a birthday card and as you can see, maybe, um my dad never like went to the I never got a Hallmark card, okay? It was always always yeah, some. <laughs> right, and the girls can attest to that. So anyway, this was a birthday card to me. Dear Lana, I'm so grateful you were born into my life at such an early age. My dad was 19 when I was born. Um, at such an early age. You have always been a source of joy to me and a continuous process of learning. Now you are a mature and beautiful and ever-evolving woman devoted to the welfare of some of the least and greatest among us. And he meant by that I was working with the Bureau of Indian Affairs, so I was always going to reservations. That is the spiritual path you were chosen for. My mother and father, his mother and father, um, are also grateful and proud of you, and they are always available to you for divine assistance. Your maternal grandfather is also grateful and proud and is definitely part of your transcendental community of support. But most important of all is the steady gaze of your higher self that never sleeps, never wanders from the path, never participates in anything that does not that does not correspond to its nature and is always present for your counsel and wisdom. I am also delighted you are here with me for this annual celebration of your current incarnation. Happy birthday. Love, your dad, this time around. <laughs> That's my dad. <laughs> <laughs> and then I have to share this one because it was, it was, I thought, really significant. This was a birthday card um, actually written to Catherine when she turned 21. Now, as you can imagine, most 21-year-olds are really excited about being 21 because, like, you could go to Georgetown and party, for example. <laughs> Not to, you know. Anyway, so this was the birthday card that my dad um, sent um, to Catherine. 
and it's called Catherine Sean also yeah <laughs> Catherine Shaughnessy's initiation 21st year in honor of your birthday April 15th 1983 it is said in the ancient wisdom teachings that every seven years a person moves into a new cycle of emphasis towards building of the fourfold self. When a child is born until age seven, the development of the physical body is paramount. From age seven to 14, the child is working on the development and understanding of the emotional body. At age 14 to 21, the mental body begins its birth and maturation. And at age 21 through 28, emphasis is on the soul. As all these bodies continue developing and balancing, we have a healthy consciousness being formed, able to consciously create a divine existence towards the service of the one life and the betterment of not only the self, but humanity. So today, we honor your entering into the cycle of the soul. What could, be more import what could be a more important moment than this? As you learn to see and feel things through your psyche, your soul, which the ancient Greeks say is in your heart, you will be more clearly able to become the authentic self you are destined to be. I shall always, I shall always treasure this day of your initiation into your soul cycle, knowing it will emerge and take the lead of your integrated existence. Happy birthday, Bapa. <laughs> what a card, you know? <laughs> so, so anyway, with that, I'm going to let um, the rest of the family take turns speaking if they wish. No pressure. But, um, but yeah, that was my dad. Thank you, Mom. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. I'm Jeannie's or Obadiah's wife's niece, and I, I just want to say thank you for all of you for being here um, as we celebrate his life. I can celebrate his life on a personal level because I know how much he meant to Jeannie. And Jeannie, uh, when they were married, it was just a, a wonderful time because he really made a difference in her life. She, um, anyway, and I think together they were very devoted to each other. It was very clear that they were really made for each other. And she grew with him, and they grew together. And they were devoted to each other as much as they were devoted to the PSR, PRS. Um, he made a difference in my life. When he joined our, when I say he joined the Chen family, um, <laughs> He was, um, you know, I think that it was an interesting time because Jeannie had a very different life before she met Obadiah. And um, it's clear that he had a devotion to her and his family, to Lana. He was very devoted. Um, and that's what we heard. And, mm -hmm. and we had a lot of similarities. We kind of went the gold blue route. So um, we had a lot to talk about. He influenced my life tremendously. He was... Um, someone that I could count on when I needed to talk to somebody. He and I shared a, a lot of similarities in our life's uh, journey, and um, his spirituality was very clear. That helped nourish my body. Um, and he was my daughter's grand godfather. So um, I, I just want to say that he, he always knew how to uh, guide me. Um, even in my darkest moments, and he certainly gave me enough Manu Hall books so that I could be <laughs> nourished. <laughs> but I appreciated that. I know that the family wasn't always into what he was into, but you know his devotion made me spiritually stronger. So um, I just want to say that he was a serious, uh, focused, and devoted scholar, and certainly committed to both his family and to um, the high, his higher power. So I'm so thankful that he inspired my life. Hello. Um, oh, sorry. Um, yes, Obadiah was um, a great grandfather to me. I am so thankful 
that I had this much time um, with him and during the last couple of years of his life to be a part mm -hmm. of his um, daily activities. Um, I got to see him more later in life. However, um, when we were um, living in Washington, um, we did talk. Not every day. Uh, months would go by, but we'd talk and we'd talk about serious things. Like, he called me the day before I had brain surgery and he gave me advice. And I always felt better after speaking with Obadiah. I felt like I, I could get through it no matter what. Um, when I was down, I was going through a bad divorce. I would talk to Obadiah and he would give me um, real life advice of things that I needed to do to go on. And um, I always felt better after talking with him. So I just want to say that um, to thank all of you for, um, for listening and for being um, part of this, this neat family that, um, that we're in. And uh, thank you. Okay, one more thing. I forgot to say that he was so inspirational that Obadiah was at my wedding my, with my husband, my second marriage, and was um, a key part of um, sort of overseeing some inspirational words as well. He was a, one of our, um, I don't know what you call it. We had a very <laughs> strange wedding. I mean, it was a very eclectic wedding, and he came and he did some readings for us. And he blessed us. He really, um, I sought his advice on whether or not I should marry Chuck, and he gave me his thoughts on that. <laughs> I just want to just use this. Hello? Okay. All right. Um, I wanted the podium. <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Catherine Martinuk, and I'm one of um, Obadiah's granddaughters. Um, you know, it always feels so formal calling him Dr. Harris. Um, I know that to the world, he was one of the greatest minds of a generation. He was a true leader in the New Age movement and a gifted teacher, preacher, and speaker. He both earned and deserved to be called a doctor in his field. But to me, he was just Bapa. <laughs> yes, I called this great man, this little grandfather nickname um, my whole life. Um, even after I grew up and had my own family, um, he was still Bapa, <laughs> which is, I just think, really funny, but, you know, names stick. Hence you're, why you're not, um, you know, Obed, Obed or whatever, Obedet. So name stick. So uh, he was still Bapa just to me and to Carolyn, and we loved him both very much. As you can probably imagine, being the granddaughter of Obadiah Harris, I had a rather unique granddaughter, grandfather experience. While most of my friends had grandfathers who told them tales about the war or about the Great Depression, um, my grandfather was busy warning me about the dangers of indulgence and the noble pursuits of balance and modesty. Uh, while most 10-year-olds were going to baseball games, when I was 10, I can remember coming here to a lecture on the yin and yang and the power of it. Um, I actually uh, asked a question and they actually called on me and took my question, which looking back and is really sweet. And, but then also when I was looking back, probably when you're sitting with Obadiah Harris and his granddaughter is asking a question, you, you take the question. So <laughs> it probably had some pull there. When I was in high school, I can remember sitting next to him while I was doing my European history homework. And I asked, Papa, why did the Roman Empire fall? Thinking he would have some insight into what, how I can write my essay. And he responded with, oh, Catherine, the downfall of society will always boil down to the pride and arrogance of man and his refusal to face his own ignorance. <laughs> About an hour later, after this unplanned lecture, I graciously thanked him and said, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Papa. I'm going to go, go write that down. <laughs> I, sh I should have known better. Uh, Papa never gave a quick or simple or conventional answer to any any question. Um, I was pretty certain that I couldn't use any of what he just said in my essay. I went to Catholic school, so I'm pretty sure they wanted things like about expansion or corruption, but um, it was okay. I still enjoy the time that he spent on me and giving me his opinion and his takes on things. He always made me think. Outside of his family, PRS, UPR, was everything to him. He loved this place and he loved its mission. He gave this place his all. 
he found such purpose and meaning in teaching and promoting the ancient wisdom. And I believe that he was driven to help others learn and lead better lives through the knowledge this place holds. And I think he did just that. Dr. Harris wanted the world to be a better place, and he had tried to achieve this goal by spreading wisdom and knowledge like wildfire. He dreamed of living in a peaceful world that was conquered not by wars or bombs, but was conquered through love, compassion, and wisdom. You may say that I'm a dreamer, but I know I'm not the only one, especially not in this room, and nor was Baba. To everyone here today, I implore you to please help keep my grandfather's dream alive. Pursue knowledge, fight for wisdom, ask questions, learn something new, stay open-minded, never stop learning, and always be kind. This is what Dr. Harris wanted. And Bapa, if you are listening right now, I just want to say it again. I love you so much. I'm a therapist. I'm not supposed to cry in public. Um, you were an amazing grandfather that made me laugh, inspired me to learn, and never failed to make me feel so loved. I will never forget you, and I know that one day we will meet again. Thank you. Hello, I'm uh, Tim Shaughnessy. Uh, uh, older daughter was my uh, father-in-law, uh, spiritual teacher, uh, ment mentor, uh, mentor, and like uh, Walter and Mitch alluded to, and most of all, I think uh, him is my great friend, and I miss him dearly, as you do too. I just want to tell a couple short stories, not a whole short story, but an anecdote, I guess. Uh, some things I know about Obadiah, but he probably didn't share much, but may maybe he did. Uh, first of all, uh, he was a first class athlete. Um, his picture still hangs in the high school in uh, Oklahoma. Uh, he scored the highest points ever in the basketball game in the history of that school. Uh, I think that, um, he was also a statewide recognized shortstop in baseball. And um, I never liked shortstop. I always liked second base. Uh, it was just too fast. And the balls were coming in the ground and right at your head. And, but he enjoyed that. Okay. Uh, I used to play pool with him just a couple of times. Um, uh, he played pool as if a pro. Uh, he started first. I said, go, you go ahead. And he cleaned the table. <laughs> so I never got a shot. <laughs> we spent, went back up upstairs and sat down. <laughs> Game's over in about five minutes. I told him I wouldn't let him start to get first again. Uh, play. Uh, he says he's, it's really easy. He sees these angles in his mind. And um, finally, he plays pool probably three or four times in his life, and probably with me. Uh, uh, he says it's, it just goes with the geometry, the, the little intellectual and the mystical that's in <laughs> mathematics. I said, okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I see, it's all different angles he's approached in life to serious issues and business issues and uh, learning. It's the angle, the direction that you're going. Uh, actually, in his 70s and 80s, he swam an hour a day, uh, usually even in inclement weather, <laughs> which... Uh, um, as a young bo uh, boy, his mother got sick, and the doctor came over, they did that in those days, and uh, <laughs> pronounced her dead. Uh, the doctor called the coroner, uh, the family was crying and grieving, and when Daya uh, felt uh, he should return to the room where his mother laid, 
And uh, he said, Mom, don't leave me. She sat up and responded, I won't, and I can't leave you. She raised her son and died again many years later. Um, in the uh, small town in Oklahoma, which uh, Mitch alluded to, uh, Obadiah would walk from the school to, to home. And he told his family uh, uh, he would visit a church on the way and converse with a preacher who was a very wise man. His parents and others told him, hey, there's no church at that location. It's an Eppley lot. Um, no others ever saw the church. His mother told him, Obadiah, if you see the church and the man inside, then the church, and he's in there too. We just are unable to see the way you do. Thank you for coming. We know many of you would like to speak, and I'm happy to acknowledge you if you'd raise your hand and uh, introduce yourself. Yes, Tom. Tom. Okay, yeah, well, I, I had a, uh, a little uh, talk prepared, and the title was How Obadiah Harris Inspired Me to Develop Enough Courage to keep on teaching in a high school classroom. And um, I'm feeling it's, I, I'm willing to forego that now uh, because it, uh, it speaks to what Mitch spoke about, the, the measurement, how Obadiah would measure you. But it's not like he was a tailor and had this tape measure. It was invisible. I didn't even know I was being measured. Uh, but anyway, but uh, when I came in here, I had such uh, a flood of memories because I knew I first met Obadiah in 2003 when he was age 70. And this speaks to uh, what Walter, I think, when you met him in 89. Well, as I speak now, I'm age 70. <laughs> that was 15 years ago. And I met Obadiah at the time when he was making that transition from the old uh, way of Manly Hall and PRS and pivoting and making that turn to uh, UPR. And uh, uh, at that time, uh, we still had the, what, this, uh, the, the 11 o'clock Sunday services, right, which were, which I used to attend. I, I live in, uh, in Van Nuys and uh, I would come in here and I would come especially early because uh, uh, the best part of it was for me was Jeannie enlisted me to uh, really dispense and set up all the, the, the pastries, especially that wonderful, uh, I don't know what they call it, but it had that uh, pecan, I mean uh, the almond in the middle, it was like, and I went, I, I'm hoping they're here. <laughs> That's the first thing that hit me when I walked in the lobby. I instinctively started looking up. The table was empty and it needs to have these, you know, I need to get the pastries on, uh, on it. And so, um, what, again, what really struck me about uh, Obadiah is that I, uh, how you never knew you were being measured because you were not being judged. You know when you're being judged, you can feel that. But what he did was was something uh, just that was uh, he didn't figure it out until until later. Now I was I had come here in uh, 2003 uh, from. Uh, I'm originally from New York City, but I lived in Texas, and I came here actually from Tennessee. Uh, I was at Vanderbilt for a while. It's a whole other story. 
Uh, but I came here in 2003 to teach. Uh, I was teaching uh, math and physics at the high school in, uh, there was a Waldorf school in Northridge called Highland Hall. And you know, Waldorf is uh, uh, teachings of uh, Rudolf Steiner and, and anthroposophy. And, uh, but the reason I looked up Obadiah was at the behest of a, a mutual friend uh, who I had been uh, friended with uh, in the 80s until his death, and that was Arthur Young, the man you know who invented the Bell helicopter, you know, the ones you see on MASH, but <laughs> whose sole reason for inventing it was to, uh, was to ground his theory of process, which uh, appealed to Obadiah when Arthur and Obadiah met, uh, I think around 1989 or 90. And uh, one of the last things Arthur said to me, uh, he died in 95, he said, uh, he said, if you ever get to Los Angeles, look up Obadiah Harris. Well, that's what I did. I got here in 2003, and then I, I, I got to see Obadiah uh, at the behest of uh, Arthur Young. So, uh, so it's very different. Uh, anyway, to, uh, one of the, the things that really uh, struck me about him was the uh, you know, the Waldorf motto is heads, heart, and hands. And uh, what Obadiah, I, I would come in and see him maybe once a month, once every every two months, and uh, uh, I was having a hard time. I was I wanted to quit teaching. I said, this really isn't, isn't for me. But he, you know, we kept the... Uh, just say it was just the, really the, the gesture, his presence, which which stuck with me. And the long and the short of it is, is that I was able to find. He was able to help me, me find the balance. I'm supposed to, you know, the the heart is supposed to balance the head and the will, you know. The, uh, but uh, Obadiah was that naturally. He was naturally balanced, and. When I speak of courage, uh, we think of it, well, courage has an opposite. Well, it's, it's cowardice, but I don't think so. It's like cowardice is, is you shrink into the fetal position. But the opposite of that is recklessness. You can be out of yourself. You need the balance, and Obadiah was always that balance. And I keep making this, this gesture, if you can see, that... He would set boundaries, but they weren't rigid. They weren't like a, a wall that you would hit against. They weren't dogmatic. Uh, but they were boundaries. He, he wasn't spaced out with no boundaries. But there were the, it was just something that was comforting to know that there was this embrace that of him that, that he would make. And that's really what made, made the difference. And... Uh, I found that when I would go back in the classroom, I was much calmer. It was not anything he, he said to me. It was just who he was and how he just uh, uh, allowed that, whatever that, that love to flow into me. And, uh, and I remember he said, you know, he said to me, well, you need to be, well, Tom, you're too much in your head. You need to, you, you need to, uh, Stop living in your head and coming from your head and just come from your heart. And, you know, and I said, well, how do I do that? Well, he said, don't worry, you'll figure it out. <laughs> and, and I did. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, that's really the, uh, just about what I wanted to say about the, uh, uh, how Obadiah really affected me. So thank you. Thank you. Bill Garlington from our board of directors. Yeah, my name is Bill Garlington, and I'm on the board here. I just want to speak briefly to this notion of this intuitive insight. Um, Tim and I go way back. Tim and I played football together in high school. <laughs> and we have the great spiritual experience of losing every day. <laughs> in any case, um, this, <laughs> the, the opportunity came up to grasp me on the board, and Tim 
just made a suggestion. I came in for an interview. My background in comparative religion. And uh, so I was ready for this pretty high powered interview with my resume. And uh, I sat down and said, What do you think of the ineffable? <laughs> <laughs> which, which ironically is the term that I often use to speak for the absolute. And so for the next hour, we spoke about Upanishads, about the uh, Magamika Buddhism, uh, and I walked out and I was on the board. <laughs> but there was just something there that was, I would call it intuitive insight. We, we met sort of automatically, and the resume never got looked at. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bill. <clears throat> yes, Justin. You may. Are you going to sing? Thank you. My name's Justin. I'm not very loud, so. Um, I'm from Santa Barbara, originally, which is about an hour and a half drive north. And um, it's like much of California, where East meets Western thinking beautifully in many ways. Um, and by the time I reached my college years, a family friend, also in Santa Barbara, took interest in mentoring me and gave me some wonderful spiritual books that set me on the spiritual path, including Manly Hall books, of course. And after I graduated, we took a field trip down to the campus here. Um, visited in the bookstore, took a tour of the library, bought the secret teachings of all ages, of course, which became one of my greatest treasures. Um, and a few years after college, I moved down to Los Angeles and became very involved in music and singing and took a few more trips occasionally over the years to the bookstore. Um, and when I got older, something in, in me called me back to this place. And uh, I enrolled as a student at UPRS. And it's an online university, so of course, the students are from all over the world. Um, but because I live so close, I had the good fortune of visiting with the faculty and staff and coming here and having more tours. And um, of course, I met Obadiah and his dear wife, Jeannie. And um, I offered to do some of the kirtan call and response chanting workshops here, uh, which he enthusiastically accepted. And we did many programs uh, in the upstairs upper room there and a few here. And um, it was a beautiful experience every time with a mix of faculty and staff and maybe a couple of students that were all also local. Uh, and um, I've told several people in this room, it was such a beautiful experience that Every time we would begin chanting, within a minute, Obadiah would have tears streaming down his face. And uh, that speaks to what some of our wonderful speakers were sharing, that he really lived close to the Spirit. Um, and when I share this story with my dear wife, she remarked that he's close to God. And um, as it should be, because Obadiah is a biblical name that means servant of God. So... Um, yeah, I really will never forget that. Um, he also inspired me to write my first book, which is uh, a wonderful thing that I'm very grateful for. And um, after he found our wonderful new president, Salyer, um, I visited with him once at his condo, and we did some more chanting. Um, and uh, then he passed, of course, recently, and he passed on the spring equinox, and the full moon. So I just can't imagine a more Maha Yogi way to go. <laughs> Incredible. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm, I'm grateful to, to be here and happy to represent all UPRS students, past, present, and future, uh, and express our infinite gratitude for saving PRS and um, creating this online wisdom university that is uh, so meaningful to so many. So, thank you, Obadiah. Thank you. Yes, anyone else? Ah, Chris. 
I need a microphone, but I will come up so we can turn around. Okay. Thank you, first of all, to the staff and Dr. Sally for having this wonderful memorial today. You know, some familiar faces, maybe you may not know me. Uh, but I will never forget the first time I heard Obadiah speak. I, it was a January day in 2003, and I had tuned in late to the NPR show.
over just about any subject and you had a voice tone on the chair and rarely you ever felt the same story twice. A couple of maybe I heard the one about uh, his mother on her deathbed or supposed deathbed. And on this Wednesday, very appropriate, uh, one story that I heard, or one anecdote that I heard more than any other, with the parting words that she gave him on her actual deathbed. And as the other guy told me, she said, Over the other hand, live a world that's reached by. I always remember that and you never tired of hearing that and always enjoy sharing that with you. So the diet is made your final crossing as you are shepherded through part of the plane, united with me and your mother. It's been a privilege and an honor to get to know Obadiah, both as a teacher, a boss, a mentor, and most of all. I'm so glad Chris is here, and it allows me to take a moment to say that there is new Manly Palmer Hall works that have just been published last Tuesday. And Chris was a part of that. Uh, he helped us get the scans from the journals that Mitch pulled uh, and into a book, an anthology called The Secret History of America, available in the bookstore. Right. Yes, Sharon. that um, Obadiah was not well in his last year or so here, maybe a couple of years. And this institution continued because of Lana Shaughnessy and Tim. It wouldn't be here without them. And Obadiah has a new book coming out, so I wonder how that happened. Yes, anyone else? Okay. Oh, yes. Hey, Juan. Just briefly, I just want to also, I will always be grateful to um, Dr. Harris for taking the chance. He was so lucky to offer this um, great university and allowing me to be part of it. And thanks to my friend Camila, who is pursuing me to talk to him and apply. Um, so, thank you so much. Thank you, Juan. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes. Frank, is that you? It is. Yeah. All right. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Frank. I, I work here as well. Um, I wasn't going to mention this, but it just came to me out of nowhere. And it was a curious thing. My sons, I have two great sons, uh, Obadiah, do one of them very well, and the other one, do that much. 
Um, so my sons and I, we watch movies from time to time, and sometimes there's are action movies. So some of you may know this, some of you may not. But we were watching a movie, it was an action movie made in England, and it was Jason's rather movie. And at the end of the movie, as the uh, credits were rolling, or right before, right after, um, they had, because of the nature of the movie, it had uh, kind of a mental uh, aspect to it, and very catchy premises and all. And so they had people speaking, philosophers, psychologists speaking. And then, and I was already working here, and then boom, there's Dr. Harris. <laughs> Jason Strather do that. I thought, well, that's unexpected in the day. So <laughs> I wasn't going to say that, but I thought, you know, it might be, uh, be interesting. Thank you. But yeah. on a more, well, not that that was a serious one, but from day one, we hit it off. And just like Chris mentioned, uh, when I was working here, I'd go down and talk with him for you know, one question about a student, or one question about a transcript or something. And he always had a story, and it was always germane, and we ended up talking for, you know, 20 minutes, even though I went down for But it was super cool. So I really, really uh, enjoyed working for a few years on a daily basis with Dr. Harris, and uh, he made a very big impact on me. Thank you, Frank. Please. And now, uh, with a performance of Ave Om, the Ave Om Shanti prayer, Dr. Vera Kare Asher Soprano. I like to just say. a very short amount of time I spent with Dr. Harris. It was incredibly impactful. Um, and I was, he called me in to strengthen his vocal stamina. Then we ended up singing. I remember the day he said to me, I think he was 83 at the time, we had already been working, he said, never in my, in the, this age, did I think I'd learn something new like, like singing. And he had a beautiful voice. Um, Jeannie was very much a part of his discipline for practice. She actually made him practice, which was wonderful. Um, so thank you. I'm so very grateful to have, um, to be able to be here in this space where we had much discussion here. We sang at that piano and we had a beautiful concert in August of 2012 where my family was able to come and join and experience this space. So um, it, it was my honor to work with my friend and colleague, Dr. Obadiah Harris, and share in the joy of singing, and should I be more specific, resonating through the sound of the voice. Ah. 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 Benedictus et benedictus. 
benedictus fructus Om Shanti Om Shanti Om Shanti And now Professor Hernandez is back for El Testament de Emilia by Miguel Yobe. Thank you. 
Now, <clears throat> I'm going to play one of Dr. Harris's favorite songs, America the Beautiful. I hope the sound is okay. If it's not, and in the spirit of Obadiah Harris, I say, we invite you to contribute to help us improve our AV. <laughs> For spacious skies, for amber winds of grain, for purple mountain majesties of all the fruited plain. America, God shed His grace on thee, and crown thy glory with brotherhood, from sea to shining sea. From sea to shining sea. I need to say that um, when my dad and Jeannie made their plans, the two songs that my dad requested for this occasion was Imagine. John Lennon, which we heard at the beginning, and America the Beautiful. Um, you know, all of his life, I, I think he voted in every election. He was he was adamant about having a voice. So, okay. So, um, <coughs> Lana and family. They need to take a rose. He wanted here, red. Oh, okay. here, you <laughs> oh the, uh, the other thing. Oh, I keep going it over here. Sorry, I keep going that's to the fine. right. Uh, the other thing that he wanted was red roses. And so that's why there were red roses around his picture. And we're wearing red roses. And there are red roses for everyone here. The, and when you came in, there were the long stem roses. Those are for you. So please take one or two when you go. Yes. I, uh, I'm a college graduate from an Ivy League school, and I knew nothing about this doctor. And I uh, came with my son, and I, I feel we're so inspired of somebody that I never knew compared to what the world is going through. <laughs> yeah. And it's so nice to know that he exists. Thank you. And that's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. If I may take one more moment, I, I mentioned uh, Dr. Harris's hiring as um, his legacy to PRS. Could I introduce you to this amazing staff? Sharon Lineker, you know. <laughs> Beside her is David Orr, who was our inaugural artist in residence and curator. Our good friend Virginia Warner is right there, who loved Obadiah. Kathy Willis, our librarian emeritus. And right beside her, Kelly Carmena, our current librarian. Astra Segay, who keeps us in the black most of the time. Brooke Macbeth, bookstore manager, who has rechristened the bookstore the Brooks Store. Mark Martz, our good friend, is back there. Ah, I see you back there, Roger. Roger Rodriguez, who ships all the Manly Hall books. And by the way, our next artist in residence is right here, Mandy Kahn. <laughs> Lana and the family have provided a reception for you in the courtyard. Please take a rose and enjoy yourself. Thank you. <laughs>